What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other bounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part of this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other bounds I know nothing but is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the
Jesus Christ, Son of God, we thank you for your redeeming blood, for your precious and sacred atonement. Fill us with your spirit. Breathe new life into us. Help us to worship you in this moment in spirit and truth. Be with us, your people. As we pray, most holy and precious name. Amen. Open up the sky.
morning that Christ was kind enough to you and me to redeem us of all of our sin what what wonderful songs to sing this morning what amazing songs and reminders to remind us of his redemption on our lives the fact that nothing but the blood of Jesus can redeem humanity of our sinful ways and our nature and it was because of his kindness Renee that we're here today and we can celebrate in that amen I watched as many of you sang these songs and were just moved because I could see in your mind that you were remembering what God has done for you through saving your soul can we close our eyes for a moment? Can we just offer thanksgiving to him? Just pray to him in your own way and thank him for his redeeming power in your life. God, we thank you today for sending your son Jesus to die for us, to be the sacrificial lamb, the one and final offering, God, that had to be made for all of humanity. Thank you, Jesus, for giving of your blood to save our souls, to redeem us today. Thank you for being kind to us when we didn't deserve it. For being generous to us and compassionate and caring to us today. Thank you that your kindness continues, God, and is still available to anyone who seeks out grace, mercy, and love that's available from your throne. Lord, we thank you today. Thank you for your saving grace for your blood and for your power that's evident in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. Can you let the Lord know how much he means to you? Put your hands together. Before you're seated, I want you to join me in, in praying today. We're not going to do it right this moment, but... Pam, is this okay? Can I say? Can I mention something? Pam's father-in-law is on his deathbed. It's just a matter of time. He's home on hospice care. She's been communicating with me this week, her and Courtney, about his condition. And I was texting Pam the other day, and we were texting back and forth, and I, I just came right out and said it. I said, well, Pam, is he a Christian? Does he know the Lord? And she said, yeah, he does. And I talked with her before church, and I asked her how things were going, and she looked at me and she said, Pastor, he admitted that he wasn't telling us the truth. He said, things aren't right with the Lord. He said, he looked at us and said, if I were to die today, I would go to hell. Because Christ is not my Savior. He's not been redeemed. She said, I looked at him and said, Billy, you can pray and ask God to forgive you. And he seemed to think he needed a pastor to help him with that. And she said, I looked at him and said, well, can my pastor come and pray with you? I know he will. So after service today, I'm going to Pam's house. Amen's right, Teresa. We've been praying for God to revive souls and to use us to be a vessel, an instrument, a city, 
a light in the darkness to see lives changed and redeemed. And I believe this is just the beginning, right, Junior? This is just the beginning of seeing lives being snatched out of hell and redeemed to heaven because of God's power and grace and love and mercy and the blood that still changes lives today. This is just the beginning, church. Your family is coming home to the Lord. I believe it. Your friends are coming back to Him. I just trust it. I know it. And as soon as I can get out of this door today, I'd go right now if y'all let me. I'd go over there and I'm going to pray with Billy. And I'm going to tell Billy about the love and the grace and the power and the mercy of Jesus and His blood. And that nothing but the blood of Jesus will save his soul from hell. And give him a hope for eternity. So I want you today to be praying for me. Pray for your pastor. Pray for Pam and this family. And pray for Billy. That God would just open his heart. And that he would give it all away. That he would invite Christ into his life. I believe he's going to do it. I believe he's going to do it. I'm celebrating already. I'm celebrating already. It's going to happen, Courtney. It's going to happen. We're going to be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6 today. Luke, chapter 6, in just a few moments, and it's going to be on the screen. But you're welcome to turn there. We are in week four of our summer series, Fruit of the Spirit. Jesus came to save all of humanity by giving of his life as a gift. And after he gave of his life, he rose from the dead and was resurrected and then he ascended and left and he left and told the disciples this is for your advantage that I am leaving you so that I can send the Holy Spirit to dwell in and among you we start out this series by making a powerful statement that God's spirit living in us is is More of an advantage. It is better than Jesus physically being here with us. He left and he told his disciples in John 16 and 7, he said, It is to your advantage that I go away so that the Father can send his Spirit to dwell in you. The fruit of the Spirit are qualities and actions that prove that someone's been changed from the inside out. The Holy Spirit works through us to help us overcome the flesh and then positions us to produce and bear fruit. Fruit such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Hopefully you know these, and if you don't, you'll be able to quote them off after this series. We started out by looking at the first three qualities and actions, and we did them together because they kind of work hand in hand with one another. The first three virtues of love, joy, and peace are not just gifts that are given to us and deposited into our lives. Yes, they are virtues that are given to us, but there's a certain amount of discipline that comes with these. I believe that the best best way for us to live out love and joy and peace, the best way is to put them into action. We experience the love of God by loving ourselves. Loving others and loving Him. We experience the joy of the Lord when we rejoice in Him. And we experience the peace that passes all understanding fully when we put our trust in Him. So by loving and by rejoicing and by trusting, we can experience love, joy, and peace. Last week, we shifted to a characteristic that is not so much felt like love, joy, and peace. And that is the virtue of patience. You don't necessarily feel patience. You can. You can be patient. Or you can be impatient. And that can generate feelings. Not necessarily of love, joy, and peace. But sometimes we we do not have patience with difficult people. I should get an amen or two right there. I even said it last week. Sometimes we don't have patience with the ones we love the most. 
In fact, we have the least amount of patience with the ones we love the most. Sometimes. Many times, if you're me. Not only do we not have patience with people sometimes, difficult people, we don't have patience in difficult circumstances. And then you've got those people who decide to be difficult while you're going through a difficult circumstance and you just become violent. You just want to take somebody's head off. You just want to, you just want to, oh, not today, Satan. I can't handle that person today. I can't handle this situation today. And I certainly can't handle them, to get, handle, handle them together. And the truth of the matter is, difficult people and difficult circumstances are not going anywhere. Nowhere in God's word does it say that it, he's going to take all those things away. No. But the Holy Spirit does give us the patience to endure and sustain us. Look at the story of Job. We all can often say, oh, that person has the patience of Job. Job lost everything. Everything that could have gone against Job went against him. We have to understand that God is not putting these situations on us to test us necessarily. He's putting these situations in our lives and these people in our lives to help us become more mature. In fact, John or James tells us, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or patience, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So today we are continuing through the fruit, and we're going to discuss one of my favorite virtues. This is one of my favorites, kindness. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, words of Jesus here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. I would say that those are actions of kindness. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Oh, that's fun. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, if you only do kindness because you expect them to do kindness to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciless. May God add his blessing to his word today. When I was in high school, that's been 25 years, folks. Just had to think about it a moment. I know some of you are older than me, many of you perhaps. But for me, that's been 25 years this year. So this month, I graduated, as a matter of fact. Jeff, don't you be smiling. You're older than I am. When I was in high school, I remember at the end of the year, each year, the seniors... The seniors would vote to hand out superlative awards to their classmates, those that are part of the senior class. 
As a matter of fact, they would even put them in the yearbook, I think, back then. Like, yeah, y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of those included most athletic. I know y'all are thinking of me already. So, Best looking. Most likely to succeed. Most studious. Class clown. That was more my gig. And the list goes on. Did anybody in here receive a superlative? Just, just out of curiosity. Okay, we'll talk after church. I oh, had five or six. All right. The rest of you, what were you doing? I remember my senior year getting to cast my vote for all of my classmates. And I remember going down that piece of paper and seeing, okay, who is the person that's most studious or most likely to succeed? And I imagine, I imagine during that time I thought, well, I have no shot at any of these. I was always a little athletic, but I wasn't the most. I was always a little studious, but not the most. I had a chance at succeeding, but it wasn't the most likely chance. And to my surprise, I got a superlative. I got voted, and it was kind of a landslide, and I was, I was shocked. And the, apparently the, the, the Dillon High School class of 1996 thought I was the most courteous person in the class. I got voted most courteous. I mean, who knew? Apparently I'm respectful and nice and a courteous guy. I mean, right? Meanwhile, I found out later, my wife got a superlative as well. She got most school spirit. Boy, I can see that one. She was the cheerleading captain. She was involved in everything. And so she was the most spirited person in her class. She's fun to live with, too. But I look back on that 25 years later, and I'm thinking, I mean, honestly, I don't know when's the last time I've mentioned that, except for the award that's hanging on my wall. <laughs> but I look back on that, I'm like, that really wasn't a big deal. It was just all in fun. That didn't mean anything. It gave me a good sermon story to share with you today. But then superlatives mean a little more when your kids get them. All of a sudden, things change, Danny, when your kids come home and like, look what I got. I got an award, a certificate. And at the end of this past school year, Charlie and Spencer, they come running in the door. It was towards the end of school, maybe the last day. Charlie came home and he walks in and he's got these two awards. He gets two superlatives. Overachiever. Charlie was voted by his classmates as the most athletic, like his dad, and the biggest influencer. Hopefully that was in positive ways. He was voted the biggest influencer and the most athletic. And then there was sassy, no-nonsense Spencer. And she's like, Dad, Dad, I got one too. And I'm thinking, oh boy. Make me proud, girl. She hands me her certificate and it read, Recognition for Showing Kindness. Oh my word. Vivian, all of a sudden, superlatives mean everything. Recognition for Showing Kindness. And just like that, She had me, man. My six-year-old little girl was voted by her class and her teacher as the one among the group who showed the most kindness. She was seen as the one who was the most friendly, the most generous, the most compassionate, the most caring. Are these not qualities that we want our children to express? Are these not qualities that we see in Christ himself? Would we not say that Christ is friendly and compassionate and generous? I mean, we just sang about his kindness leads us to repentance. It's what draws us to him. And at six years old, she may not even realize what she is resembling, but yet she's resembling Christ to her classmates. They didn't give her this. What I... I, I I like to think, as her dad, that she was the most Christ-like. 
Maybe she was the one that, that drew them. Spencer, your kindness draws me to have what you have in your life. Wow, isn't that powerful? From a six-year-old. You see, when you think about kindness, we can, we can choose to be kind in certain moments, right? We can turn it on. Even sinners, y'all read the text with me, right? Even sinners choose to be kind. We can turn it on when we really want it. If we want to manipulate a situation. Hey, I can be real kind when I'm trying to haggle at a price with somebody. You ain't never seen me be kind until I'm trying to get a deal. I mean, I'm like glowing I'm so kind. Right. I, 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 when I need to be kind, I can be. Or, or perhaps we can be kind to certain people when we have to, right? If we have to, we can, we can do it. We can fake it till we make it. We can make ourselves do this, but genuine kindness is not sporadic. And there's not an on and off switch to it. When you think about genuine kindness, not just being kind in a moment, but genuine kindness, like, like living it out to the point that you get voted by everybody around you as the most kind person. That's genuine. That's not sporadic. At that point, it becomes a lifestyle. I like to think that Spencer was voted this because she takes on kindness as a lifestyle. At least at school. We're working on getting that translated to home. I'm just, just teasing her. You see, when we exemplify genuine godly kindness, it is recognized by others. People see it in our lives. And let's be honest, it's not very difficult to point out kindness that is insincere. You can see right through somebody too when it's not genuine. When they're just turning it on for the moment. Or they're just being kind to you because of who you are. I saw that in law enforcement. People were awfully kind, man, when I had the ticket book in the hand. But then you write that ticket and they realize their kindness is not going to get them anything special. Oh, they turn into monsters. I'm not kidding. They tried to be kind in the moment. I could see right through it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't like me this much. If we want to show genuine kindness, we must remember that we must keep Jesus first in all things. We must live by his example and according to his model that he's given to us in his word. You see, kindness is a desire to know the love of Jesus and to live it out. And when we live our lives according to the example of Christ, we decide to be someone who is kind to everyone rather than being someone who is kind to just some in some moments. It's a big difference. And we have to choose to live out the love of Christ so that we can be kind to everyone in all moments. You see, Jesus showed kindness to his friends. He showed kindness to his family, his enemies, to the greatest among him, and to the least. The fruit of kindness is about showing kindness to those who cannot return the favor. You want to test someone's kindness? See if they're kind to those who can't return the favor to them. We just read this in the text. Even sinners will give to sinners who can't on occasion. But most people are not going to give to someone who can't give it back to them. A just because or out of a heart of love. If kindness is about being generous, friendly, and caring, then the words of Christ that we read here in our text today have to be clear instructions for us to be kind. Yes, the text references love and love for your enemies, but there's so much here about us being kind. 
Because it says we're to do good to those who hate us. We're to bless those who curse us. And we're to pray for those who mistreat us. How easy is that? Oh, that's easy, right? It's, come on, it's so easy to pray for the ones who mistreat you. It's easy to do good to those who hate you. That's, that's almost impossible on our own. It is when we love and allow this kindness to shine through us that when someone takes our coat, we offer them our shirt as well. It's in these moments that we do unto others as we'd have them to do unto us. And I'll be honest, I want people to be kind to me. I want people to be kind to me. We do good. We show kindness to everyone in every circumstance. We were at a restaurant recently, my family and I, and we got a waiter, and you could tell that he was having a bad day. It was just, you know, they're all shorthanded and busy, and I get it. And from the first time he came to our table, I looked at Mitzi after he left, I was like, whew, we got us a humdinger today. He was not happy to be at work. And I got it. But you know what we did? We chose kindness. And I looked at her after we paid our bill and I was like, well, that completely shifted, didn't it? Because by the time we left, he was laughing with us and talking with us and we tipped him well. And it was a completely different scene than what it started. Because we chose to show kindness and it changed this guy's trajectory. It changed his day. It changed the moment for him. You see, in showing kindness to everyone, Jesus was consistent. It didn't matter who he was dealing with, who he was speaking to, interacting with in that moment. He chose kindness with no strings attached. You see, kindness is not reactive. But it is consistent. You hear me? Kindness is not just about reacting to a situation. It is consistent. Kindness is not devious. It doesn't manipulate. Unless you're trying to get a really good deal. Kidding. It's consistent. Kindness is not subjective. Boy, that's the tough one. You don't just choose to be kind because you're having a good day that day. Well, it's Sunday. I probably should be kind today. It's the Lord's day. It's not subject to that. It's not subjective to that. No, it's not subjective to what's going on in your life. You should be kind at all times. Jesus was breathing his last breath and was kind on the cross. So kind as to forgive one of the thieves. He chose kindness. His kindness was consistent. Kindness is showing genuine, godly friendliness, generosity, compassion, and care to anyone and everyone in all circumstances. Kindness is about being intentional in showing externally what the Holy Spirit has done inside of us internally. It's about expressing the work of the Holy Spirit. You can tell when someone's been changed by the power of God. Sometimes just by how kind they are. I've had people say that to me. Man, what, it is, what is it about you? You're just, a, you're just too nice. You're too friendly. You're too, not, you're too caring. Too compassionate. Nothing within myself, Inez. It's the the power of the Holy Spirit that's imparted that kindness into me. And then me being intentional about sharing it and showing it, especially to those who don't deserve it and can't repay it. And we have those people in our lives, right? You're going to encounter somebody this week that's not real kind to you. Maybe they've done you wrong. Maybe they've mistreated you. How are you going to choose to show 
kindness. This week, as you stand with me this morning, Philip, you can come. Tuesday night, I was over at Jack and Linda's. We were shooting some guns. Pow, pow. All in the name of safety and sport. We were over shooting some guns, and there was four or five of us men over there, and all of a sudden, I disappeared. Philip said, John told him, said, I looked around, and actually was gone. They thought the rapture had taken place. I kid. Sorry. But I was standing there at the at the at Jack's house and we had just taken a break and we're about to go shoot some more and I got a notification on my phone. And I looked and we have a, a ring doorbell outside of our church here so that people can contact us or ring it or I can see who's here, that sort of thing. Sometimes people say, I came and knocked on the door and I was downstairs in the gym. I didn't hear the door knock. Well, I got a notification that someone was at the church. And I figured, well, it's probably one of the, the Walker County Sheriff's deputies. They sit here all the time. But I look and it showed me a, like a screenshot of the, the image and it was, it was a curious gentleman. And so I opened up my phone and I opened it and I was like, to see the video. And I see this gentleman pulling on doorknobs, door handles, trying to get in the church. And then I see him looking under flower pots like he's trying to find a key, a way in. Well, we get people here all the time pulling on door handles. It was in the middle, it was, this was, it was still daylight. It was about 7 o'clock. It was still daylight. And when I'm here during the day, sometimes I'll hear somebody tug on the door and it's someone stopping by asking for something or needing prayer. It happens a lot. But we don't usually see them scrum, uh, rummaging through our, our flower pots and looking for keys. He looked like he was up to no good. We'll just put it that way. He walked even downstairs and tried to get in the gym on the lower level and Thankfully, all the doors were secure. And I decided in that moment, because I knew there had been a lot of vandalism going on in our area at churches and Ridgeland High School had been hit. I said, you know what? I better call the sheriff's office. So I called them, and I drove over from Jack and Linda's, and I met them here. I said, hey, I'm close by. I'll meet the deputies. So I met him when he had just left. He was gone. And so the deputies looked at me. I showed them the video, and they were like, hey, can we have this video, and can we do a report because this could help us with other incidents? I was like, hey, that's fine. I didn't expect all that. Next thing I know, it's on the news. James Burton's calling me saying, hey, who's pulling on door handles? Nothing bad happened. Thank the Lord. But I thought about that this week as I was preparing this sermon. I thought to myself, I don't know what that gentleman needed or was after, but I wish he'd come talk to me so that we could show him some kindness. If he needs money, we'd give him money. If he needs clothes, we'd go buy him some clothes. If he needs food, Randy, we'll go get him some food. Man, we'll give him more food than he ever could eat. I have no hard feelings towards that gentleman. I hope he get what he gets what he needs. And I, I would love to know that we could be the ones that could help him. That's my prayer now is that I see him one day this week walking by and I can pull up to him and say, hey man, this is who I am, this is who we are, we want to just be kind to you. Can we show you some kindness? I want you to do that this week. Show kindness to someone who maybe doesn't deserve it. Show kindness to someone that maybe won't choose to repay it or can't repay it. Let the Holy Spirit work through you this week. Be kind to everyone in all situations. Very basic sermon today. Nothing spectacular here, but a good reminder of who we're supposed to be. Because here's the, here's the reality. If His kindness brings us to repentance, then our kindness 
may do just the same. It may draw others to want what you have in your life. Amen? Amen.